This week's episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show is sponsored by North Broad Street Records, bringing you the very best in unissued music. North Broad Street Records discovers and brings to vinyl cool, unfinished gems. For more information, please visit www.northbroadst.co.uk. Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. He called me in, it was just a routine kind of visit. He put a bit of paper in front of me and said, we're looking to bring in a general manager. You're who we want, would you be interested? I didn't even look at it, I just said <laughs> Absolute no-brainer, was it? Just thinking back, I'd been in that school at nine, ten year old, thinking, looking at the Pars players in their blazers, thinking, ah, oh, what would be like that? And here I am, back in my old school, in a club blazer. And I remember going home, like, over months, and I'd be playing with my, my kids, so bathing them, and just didn't have a clue what was going on. Mm-hmm. My head was away, in the clouds. And I turned to my partner one night and broke down again. I just said, I need to change this. I need out here. I need to get my life back. Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Show. I'm David Simmons, and this week's guest is an absolute belter. What a story this man's got to tell. We've got former Dunfermline Athletic FC general manager Mikey Matkevich in the studio today. Mikey, thanks for coming on, mate. No problem. You got my name right as well. So. Oh, did I? I take it there's no many to do that, is it? <laughs> no, I'm used to it. <laughs> Mikey, like I said, you were general manager of Dunfermline Athletic. Big Pars fan. You grew up yep. in Took, which is 1.6 miles away from East End Park. Yeah. What's your early memories of Dunfermline Athletic? Ah, plenty, to be honest. You could do the show just on that. But um, yeah, like you say, it was just around the corner from the stadium. So on a Saturday you'd be playing football in the, in the local park and if the game was on at East End you could hear all the crowd noises, you'd hear the roars if there was a goal and you'd be running back to check the teletext to, to see the scores but I grew up in a place like you say Took and it was a great community like there was loads of us the same kind of age group and, uh, you know it was the usual 20 aside football World Cup secrets, knockout, all the usual kind of football games you didn't see on the streets now yep. so but quite a lot of us were Dunfermline fans so it was, it was a great time to grow up um, who, who was kind of playing in, in that era? Who was your favourite player as a youngster? Favourite player? So, it was the mid-90s I really got hooked on, on the pars properly. Um, big Nori McCarthy was was a hero. Um, unfortunately, lost his life in the January of 96. Um, but after that, Big Andy Todd uh, was a bit of an icon for me. I always kind of tried to model myself on Andy Todd. Big, tall, dark hair. Yep. Defender, that's where I kind of played, so... Um, I Andy Todd really grown up. One of your big players. Aye. Is there any games that stands out like, when you were growing up? You think, oh wow, that was aye. that was a brilliant game. Aye, there's loads. My, my dad got me into the pars originally. Him, him and my uncle were big on film supporters, and he started taking me in the early nineties. Um, but you know, I was, was five, six, seven year old, just not even interested. I kind of vaguely remember going and just constantly moaning and more interested in looking around the stadium, the terraces, rather than watching the game of football. So he stopped taking me. And then my mate, uh, good mate of mine, growing up, Stephen Lind, him and his dad, Jim, uh, started taking me again about 95. And that was the year Dunfermline were going for the championship. So a lot of my generation got hooked on, on the football club around about then. It was Bert Pate and Dick Campbell were kind of leading the charge and just local guys who got the club and really got, got the community going again. Um, iconic games that season straight away, the one at Tanadice, we won 1-0, second last game of the season. Stuart Peter they scored early. I think about eight minutes in, and then got sent off. <laughs> uh, we held on, 1-1-0. One, one, Dundee United had the trophy that day. The trophy was at Tanadise with the tangerine ribbons on it. And uh, we went there and beat them. And then the following week, we, we clinched the, the league title, beating Airdrie 2-1. That's probably the first first main one being at. And remember the helicopter kind of flying over with the trophy, and it's brilliant. Uh, so you're hooked uh, yeah, at a young age obviously it stayed with you all through your days because you yeah. ended up like doing quite a lot for the club which we'll touch on as we go through the interview yeah. but you, you started running supporters buses to away games as well didn't you? Aye so how that come about was I've always been obsessed with, with Jim Leishman and his, his kind of era in the 80s of the football club because he got he got the club from you know, 600 people to, to 14,000 people yep. in the space of 10 years so I always used to look at press cuttings and, and see what he was doing around publicity and, and how he was driving the support back to East End Park and, and one of the things he always mentioned was the club had about 28 supporters clubs at one point now in 2013 I think they had three mm. so me and my mates got together kind of coincided with the club going into administration so 
we kind of thought, right, how, how can we get together and, and try and make money for the club? So we thought, let's, let's start a sports club. We'll have fundraising nights, we'll, we'll raise money. It's uh, player of the year spon- uh, dances, we'll get sponsors, blah, blah, blah. So it kind of snowballed from there. Yep. So uh, in 2013, we, we got together in the local pub we drank in, the Elizabethan, <laughs> uh, on Holby Road. Good pub, by the way. <laughs> uh, and I, we got together and we just, the first game was four for away in the playoffs. But at that point, the, the club were on their knees. You know, we were in administration. We were, I mean, how close were they to actually like uh, going going out of business? I, I think it was minutes. Really? You know, I think, I remember hearing before, it was about 40 minutes away from complete gone. Game over. And and the fans got together and saved that football club. It's, it was, it's a phenomenal story, actually. Yeah, I mean, you tell us about that story because you've done yeah. like loads of fundraising for it. I mean, one of the ones that you did was in the Valley, a fundraising yeah. project. What was yeah. that all about? So that was probably the first project I got got involved with. Uh, so that come about with the club going into administration. So a group of supporters got together, including uh, our very own Paul John Dykes, <laughs> uh, who got on board to help us. Um, so I got involved with that, really looking at my background as graphic design and marketing. So I wanted to get involved and help them design the book, uh, promote it and market it once it come out. So the book was basically a story of the club from 95, 95 to 2005. It was like the first edition we were focusing on. So I got involved in that. And uh, from there, we had a, a big fundraising dinner at East End Park. So one of my one of my pals is a guy called Andrew Skerla, who used to play for them, Fairman, right. uh, a total icon at the club. And he was good enough to send us some signed shirts, uh, along with a lot of other kind of former players. And we raised loads of money that night. And uh, a mutual, a pal of mine that went on the supporters bus, a guy called Davy Crow. Uh, introduced me to a guy I'd never met before, never heard of him and having a few beers that night uh, I got introduced to him and I just remember going off on one about we need to be doing this, we need to be marketing ourselves better in the community get into the schools, we need to get the players doing this social media needs to be better, we need a better website we need to be doing merchandise, blah blah blah, blah. I just fired loads of stuff at him and then like the next day he texted me saying I want to meet up with you, I want to speak to you and he was on the same page and it was a guy Ross MacArthur uh-huh. um, who eventually become the club chairman still is the club chairman. Yeah, because you've, you went on, like I say, you started off doing like supporters buses, Aye. fundraisers. You started getting involved in that, didn't you? The yeah. the whole sort of marketing and PR Aye. side of things so, for the club. Like I said, it snowballed really quick. So I met Ross in the Elizabethan actually and I just went through. He said, right, what, what are your ideas? What, what do you want to do for the football club? And just having that marketing, PR, graphic design background, I just rattled off all the stuff that I could, could help with. And one of the first ones was the social media channels. So me and my pal Craig Brown, who's the club photographer, and Craig's still involved at the club. Uh, we just revitalised all that with the content, branding stuff up. We put together, well, I put together a new club badge with a graphic designer at my work at the time right. at uh, Fife College. And uh, we started putting a brand toolkit together. So everything that was coming out of the club was professional, it was consistent, um, it looked good, feel good. You know what I Having a marketing background, it's like if something looks good and has that feel good about it, it makes others feel good. Yep. Being part of it. So that kind of how it's how, how it started out. So were you doing this all like on a voluntary basis? So aye, so it was voluntary. So like I say, at, at the time I was working at Fife College and my boss at the time was a, a big big Dunfermline supporter, our, our uh, uncle actually played for Dunfell in the sixties. So she was really sound about right, listen, I don't mind you doing PARS work, but just make sure your actual work gets done. So I was doing it during the day, and then I was going home at night and doing PARS stuff every night. You know, it was for about three years, I was doing PARS work every day, voluntary, but it was just the love of the club. You just, you wanted to fix things and get things going again, and that was the way I could contribute to the club. Yeah, because eventually, obviously, all your voluntary work had paid off because you were approached in 2016 to take on a more professional role within the club, weren't you? Aye, so we just won League Two, uh, had a really good season and just as a, as a kid it was always your dream to play for the, the club you support and then the next best thing was to, to work for them. And I always remember being a kid at, at uh, Took Primary School and, and seeing the players coming to visit the school and they'd always have the blazers on with the, the club tie and just thinking, I want to be like that. And uh, Ross, we used to meet up every week uh, and just bounce ideas back and forth and uh, he called me in. I'd just come back from Liverpool for a wee, wee trip away, and he called me in. I was just a routine kind of visit. And he put a bit of paper in front of me and said, We're looking to bring in a general manager. 
you're who we want. Would you be interested? I didn't even look at it. I just said, <laughs> absolutely no brainer, was it? Of course, yeah. it doesn't matter about money, what the job is. I, of course, I want it. It's so, was it that stage? Did you have to jack in your job at Fife College? And I, Fife College is a great place to work, and I wasn't looking to leave. Obviously, it's my dream to always, always want to work at Dunfermline. Yep. So, it was a, a no brainer. There's always that bit in the back of your mind, like, should I, should I not? But if I hadn't taken it, I'd have regretted it for the rest of my life. You'll never know, eh? <laughs> but anyway, so you jumped in two feet with that. That was in 2016. Yeah. You were the youngest general manager in Scottish football history, the youngest at the club as well. It was yeah. all on Sky Sports News. What age uh, were you when you, you took that role? I was 29. 29, 29. Running a football club. Ah, uh, it was crazy. And my phone and social media just went into a meltdown. Straight away, all, all my mates screenshotting Sky Sports News and saying it to me. It was just, it was mad. A bit surreal now, feeling yeah, back. It's still thinking. surreal. Yeah. Dave, it's still surreal. It still feels like it didn't happen, to be honest. Um, but aye, it's just mad. And then you've got journalists phoning you wanting to speak to you because you've got that supporter from the terrace and the boardroom kind of story. And it's just crazy, really crazy. So what did that role involve? What was what was your, your general manager role? What did you do? Oh, what sort of things did you cover? It was massive. Um, so from my, my own kind of skill set, which was marketing, PR, graphic design, social media, website, email marketing, but then the stadium management, dealing with the press, dealing with the staff, managing the shop, uh, dealing with the players, dealing with the manager, dealing with away days, home matches, organising the stewarding, the catering, the sponsors, the commercial side of the business. It was massive. That's it was, it. A lot of people don't appreciate the actual work that goes into a football club. Nah, it's not just a, a Saturday at three o'clock, is it? No. Nah, it uh, and the thing is, with a club like Dunfermline, you know, there's no resources. You know, you've got four or five full-time staff we are constantly spinning plates. We're doing three or four jobs. So if you go to a club like a Celtic or even a Hearts or Hibs, you know, they've got one person just focusing on PR and marketing. We had one person focusing on four or five jobs, constant. And it's a, it's a stressful environment. It's difficult. When you took took on that role, was there anything that you thought, like, I want to achieve this for the club? Was there any ambitious targets that you set and you thought, I really mm. want to take Dunfermline here or I want to achieve this in this role? I think the, the main, on the pitch was to get back to the Premier League, as it still is, yep. or the SPFL. Um, but for me, like I, said, like I said before about the Jim Leishman era, I just wanted to get the club going again. I wanted to get us back in national newspapers and back in the press, back in... Getting other uh, supporters of other clubs just thinking, what a good club Dunfermline is. You know, I think that was the mentality for a long, long time, but maybe over the last 20 years that's kind of gone away a wee bit. But, uh, that was always in my mind. I just wanted people to, to think, make our supporters feel proud, yep. first and foremost, but other, make other people notice the football club. So you've mentioned, Mikey, all the, all the roles you did within your role as general manager. Yep. Did you have any input on the strips that the players were wearing? Or? Aye, so when I got involved as a volunteer, I started inputting. Like, I didn't used to design them at that point, but it was kind of like, here's what we're thinking. What do you think? How would you change that? What would you... So I got involved with that and then the, the whole launch of kits. So myself and the club photographer, Craig, would do all the photo shoot, the filming for, to launch it on social. Now the club before were, were not using social media as a shop window for anything. Yep. So we started obviously building up like five days to go to the new home kit, two days, for one day, blah, blah, blah. And then launching it, buy it now, bang when it's hot. And then when I got the job as GM, I was designing the kits pretty much. Um, and, and the best one was the 67, 68, 50 years on, 17, 18. So we redone the home kit the same as the 68 kit. Um, which was the best selling home kit I think for, for a long time for the club so how do you go about designing a kit for like I mean Aye. these are things that as supporters we don't know about how Aye. does how do you get from having an idea of, of having this kit to Aye. actually having it in the club shop so so my background is a graphic designer I would kind of do a, a rough kind of design anyway I, I was always tuned into what supporters because it, I was the film fan I knew what supporters wanted mm. and I was big on the retro stuff before that kind of got big so we were quite hot on that. So um, I used to just jot ideas down and, and our shirt um, supplier at the time, Joma, who's, who's still still there, a guy, Andy Barriman, who used to play for them firm, and he's like the brand manager for Scotland. Right. Uh, we'd sit down with Andy and just kind of say, right, this is what we were thinking. He would then send it to Joma headquarters and they would kind of make it look better, create a proper shirt. And then you would kind of analyse it, saying, oh, maybe change the collar a bit, maybe stripes need to be a bit thicker, blah, 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 blah. And then I only got to experience it once, but I got to go across to Joma HQ just outside Madrid right. in Spain. 
and, and you get to meet all the guys in the factory and and the main management, it's a family run business in Spain. It was, uh, it was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant experience and to know you've designed a Pars kit is just amazing, eh? Brilliant, brilliant. Obviously one of the key figures uh, throughout Dunfermline's history is Mr Jim Leishman. Yeah. You mentioned that you wanted to bring the good times back like what he had at Dunfermline. Yeah. Um, did you have a good relationship with him? Aye, uh, me and Jim's pretty good pals which is a bit strange because he's like 67 year old and I'm only 34 <laughs> but Jim's unbelievable what he's done for that football club and still doing voluntary now as well Jim doesn't get paid you know a lot of supporters used to constantly be at me about when 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 it was negative about Jim as a target because he was a public face of Dunfermline but Jim what Jim done in the 80s for Dunfermline you know you can't underestimate that we were he was in Scott Sport and on St. St. Greavesy every week and daily record back pages and Dressing up as a cowboy. I don't know if you've seen that for. <laughs> Aye. So going but another wee story going a wee bit off topic. When I was there, <laughs> we were f- uh, fighting for the league with Dundee United at the time. And I spoke to the son. I've got an idea for the, the goal supplement. So building up to, we were playing Dundee United that Saturday at home. I said, how about I get one of the, the key players to dress up like this picture? So in a green cowboy outfit, smoke the cigar, blah, blah, blah. Brilliant, we'll do it, we'll do it, full page, well up for it. And then the manager heard and I got, I got an absolute roasting. Oh, no. Yeah, he wasn't, wasn't keen, unfortunately. So, so it never happened. never happened, but aye, going back to Jim, aye, Jim's a great guy and when he was at the club in the 80s, he was so forward thinking, I think he was ahead of his time. You know, Jim, Jim will be the first to admit, maybe tactical wise he's not, but as a motivator and a PR man, he was an absolute genius, total genius. You know, we were getting crazy publicity and I just always looked at old books and news cuttings and always spoke to Jim about oh well, how did you do that and he would always give me ideas and even still Jim's still full of ideas and so was he always there for advice if you had any always aye. always you must have some stories to tell about Jim Leishman he seems that kind aye. of character <laughs> that are clean aye. maybe <laughs> I've been at Magoth a few times with him we'll just leave that there but uh, <laughs> I've aye, got so. this image of Jim Leishman in like BCM now oh well aye I could tell you a few stories but <laughs> No, he's an unbelievable guy and what an ambassador for Dunfermline Football Club. He's, you look at Jim, Jim's exactly what Dunfermline Athletic is. You know, the same with Bert Pate and Dick Campbell were just community guys who get the club. You know, they're not in it for kudos or money or any of that. They just, they know it, they get it and sure. want Dunfermline to be where it deserves to be. We touched on it earlier about uh, administration and how close Dunfermline actually came to it. Mm-hmm. What do you think would happen if the whole what if, what if Dunfermline did go down? How big a right. gap would that have left? <sighs> Massive. Dunfermline's a community club. There's no doubt. Dunfermline's in a cup final. There's 20,000 people going to Hamden. You know, I remember in 2004, every shop window on the high street had Dunfermline stuff up. You know, if things are going well in the park, it gives the whole town a boost. And I remember when, for the commercial side of the business, we used to contact all the local pubs who who weren't sponsoring the club, they didn't put a penny in, but we were saying, listen, the Dunfermline's in the Premier League and you're getting 300 Celtic fans in your pub every Saturday, that's because the football club's doing well, so is it not fair you kind of guys back us as well? To be fair, a few pubs did. Um, But again, that was Jim's advice. Jim, when Jim was there in the 80s, he went round all the pubs in the community centres and the clubs and rallied everybody and got everybody behind the club. That's what it's all about. So what happened then? How did how did they get to that stage that they did almost end up in the administration? <sighs> Mismanagement. Try to punch above our weight. You know, we were trying to aim for the top three in the league and building a corporate stadium and trying to get back in Europe. We're just spending silly money on players. You know, we, we were paying five grand plus a week on wages. Just it just wasn't feasible. We you know, we, our gates were only three, four, five thousand. I think that at the time you know, Rangers Celtic were so strong, you were never going to go for a league title. The best you could achieve was third. And we got, we got, we finished fourth and got to a cup final in 2 4. But after that, you know, another two cup finals, I think we got three cup finals in four years, yep. which is unbelievable. And after that, it just dipped r- rapidly. You know, I think, I think the, the chairman and, and the board at the time, you know, in their heart was trying to do the right thing and get the club to, you know, the best it could be, but I think we just lost track here and you know, just got deeper and deeper. And by 2.12, it was nearly game over. Obviously, we're going through the whole pandemic at the moment with COVID-19. 
Once this all passes, do you think that there should really be an investment and initiative to get more supporters back into East End Park? Um, I, I think it's all about how the team are doing on the park. You know, if they're failing, they're going for first spot. Plus the exciting news with the German investment, you know, it can only get the fans back. Um, but it's going to be tough for a lot of clubs. A lot of clubs, I think the government are going to have to help quick. Because a lot of clubs, especially on the lower end, you know, your League Twos, League Ones are are going to be toiling. I think Aberdeen were out the other day saying they've lost, was it 1.5 million or something a month they're losing? It's a lot of money to teams like Aberdeen and obviously Rangers have posted as well their losses, which is frightening. It's not sustainable. It's, and the quicker we get fans back in, the better. I don't I don't see why why we can't. I mean, I know there's already been, what, testing up in Ross County and I yep. think that um, Boris Johnson said that after the lockdown in England, they're going to welcome back fans as well so I think you're right as long as they're, they're socially distanced in yeah. there will you be attending with your young ones I will definitely definitely they're only two and three at the moment but next couple of years I'll be I'll be back with a scarf around my neck exactly I mean you touched on it earlier how was the transition from being a supporter mm. to being one of the main men at the club how was that transition was it a bit of a shock to you did you realise how, how much you were really taking on uh, it was a major shock very quick big eye opener um it was really hard, I'm not going to lie, it was extremely difficult. I'd never been a manager before, or any, in any sort of management position, never mind work at a football club. Yep. And all of a sudden you're having to deal with staff and deal with situations you'd never dealt with before. You know, I was going in every day and the showers aren't working, or the undersoil heating systems aren't working, or a supporter's been on the phone complaining because his bridey was cold on Saturday, <laughs> or, or my mate got chucked out the game on Saturday, can you, can you sort it? And it was just... Constant. Constantly spinning. Twenty four seven. Imagine. Hey, how was your relationship with the chairman, Ross MacArthur? You've mentioned him yeah, a few times. Did you yeah. did you get on well with him or I did, I Ross it's, if it wasn't for Ross, like who who knows where the football club would be, to be yeah. perfectly honest. He's been an absolute saviour and he's a humble guy as well. You know, he doesn't seek publicity or, or want to be in the limelight. He's just a, a really good, decent, honest guy. And uh, like I say, Ross got involved two thirteen. Still there now as chairman, steering that ship. So, no, a great guy, and um, I owe him a lot actually for giving me the opportunity. Because yep. if it wasn't for Ross or that chance meeting with Ross at into the Valley Night, like, who knows? Who knows? Like, not many football uh, football supporters get the opportunity to work for the club they support. Never mind be a general manager. So it. your story's fascinating, Mike. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's brilliant. So I mean. Like I say, in that role, you, you brought in a lot of initiatives. Uh, a few that stand out for me is your April Fools that you've done <laughs> with Hibs. Uh, tell us about that. It's a great story. Aye, so <clears throat> when I was there, like I said, I wanted to create relationships with the press and media, other clubs. And the, the whole purpose of, the, purpose of that was to go to other clubs and bounce ideas back and forward. Say, right, how, how are you guys selling trackside boards? What match day sponsorship packages are you putting together? How are you doing ticketing? How are you doing your club shop? Blah, 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 blah. So we created relationships with various clubs, um, and Hibs were, were a top club. You know, at the time, it was a guy, Greg Mailer, who's now down at Man United. Wow. Um, and Greg was, was brilliant with me. Uh, so we used to go across the Easter Road a few times uh, over the course of a season and uh, just created a relationship like, really good with us and you know, realised you know, Dunfermline were a good club and wanted to help us out and we wanted to help them out when we could. Um, and then the flip side of the, the relationship with the press and media, so we were constantly trying to get stories to the press to get coverage because the club had never had positive PR for years, especially the administration. So I contacted Dad at the Sun at the time, who's Kenny Miller, who now works at Hibs. Right. Um, and I phoned Kenny, I said, right, I've got an idea for an April Fool's, we're going to swap mascots. I'm feeling we're playing Hibs at East End, that April Fool's. Hibs were going for the league, we were going for the playoffs, so it was going to be a big game, big crowd. And the sun ran it as a story. So we got great publicity. So we had Sunshine the Lynx <coughs> as, uh, in the Pars kit, and we had Sammy the Tammy in the Hibs kit. Um, and uh, it was just good publicity, good, good fun banter. And STV News ran it, it was in a couple of the papers. So that, that was the name of the game. Brilliant. You also uh, had an initiative with Bellhaven Beard, didn't you? Aye, so Bellhaven were a, a club sponsor. Anyway, they kind of looked after a lot of. A lot of the corporate side of the, of the club. Um, but we were always bouncing ideas back and forth with sponsors. And one of the ideas I had was in 2017-18, which was the 50 years since the uh, Scottish Cup won in 1968. So 
we approached Belhaven to see if they would do a club beer. And the whole campaign was called the Lap of Honour. Um, famously, the, the story goes, we won the Cup in 68. The police stopped us getting a Lap of Honour because the previous season there was riots at Hamden. Right. I'm not going to mention what clubs were involved. <laughs> see you can guess. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we wanted to kind of cream it, uh, give the guys a Lap of Honour and give them a, a special season. So one of the ideas was... Bellhaven coming in making our own beer which we sold in the club bars and it, it flew it was so popular um, and another idea I had just before I left I, don't, I still don't think any clubs have done this was to sell non-alcoholic beer in the kiosks right unfortunately it can't be alcoholic as yet because we're not allowed but non-alcoholic just giving supporters that feeling of having a beer at the football uh-huh. you know, easy done and Bellhaven were all for that Brilliant. I mean, as I like you say, that's it's a great idea actually. Why why have other clubs not thought of that? I don't know. It's actually quite a, a good. They might do now. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> I've given you an exclusive, guys. Um, it's a good actual conversation starter that because mm. at rugby you can go yep. to Murrayfield and get yourself yep. a couple of pints, sit and enjoy the game, get a glass of wine and stuff like that. Yeah. But not at football. Why? Why do you think that is? Government stuck in their ways, perhaps. The thing is, for me. If a game's on at 3 o'clock or 12 o'clock, you're still going to go to the pub or go to your mate's house and get tanked up on bevy. It doesn't matter if you're in a house, in a pub or in the football stadium. Yep. You're better getting them um, in the, a controlled environment within a stand than having them out in the streets. And that must bring in some revenue for a club as well if they could, could sell alcohol. In there. Especially nowadays, Scottish football clubs need as much money as they, they can get. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's short-sighted if you're asking me. Definitely. I mean, we've touched on a few things you've done in your role as general manager. Is there any sort of highlights that stand out for you? You're like, okay, wow, that was great. Like, obviously, you had your aye. name on Sky Sports News, aye. but as a. Aye, there was one one in particular, one real high for me, and it was probably one of the most nervous I've ever been. We had a school engagement programme, which was brilliant. I, I don't know if it's still going, but we used to send players to local primary schools and high schools every week yep. and then invite them into the, into the club and, and they see how the business worked, how the ground staff done, how the commercial side worked, how the physios work. And then my old primary school to primary asked me to, to go and do a talk to some kids. Now, I'd never been back in the school since 98, since I left. So I was like, right, okay. So it was myself and John Potter, who was one of the coaches at the time. Yeah, he's at Hibs now, yeah? He's at Hibs. Hi, right. John's a, a brilliant guy. Um, so John was going to focus on the football side and I'm kind of going to give my, my marketing spiel and at the time we had free season tickets for under 12s yeah. so I'm going to try and drill out this message that come and support the pars <laughs> and I turn up at the school in my blazer like just thinking back I'd been in that school at 9, 10 year old thinking looking at the pars players in their blazers thinking ah, I want to be like that and here I am back in my old school in a club blazer and I turn up, turn up to the, assemb- the assembly hall and there's 360 kids there. <laughs> the whole school. Most nervous I've ever been in my life. But that, that that was a real positive for me, just going back and speaking to some of the teachers who, and one of them said they were so proud of me and I just, unbelievable. Aye, I bet. So after everything you've done in your two and a half years Aye. as general manager, it's, that was Aye, the, the most nervous you were. There was a lot of highs, a lot of lows, but that was one of the most nervous I've been, but brilliant yeah. I remember leaving the school that day on a total high I went back to the club to hear um, undersoil heating system wasn't working and we had a game at home in three days time so you better get fixed yeah. Aye, so Fun and games. that's what it was like <laughs> as I mentioned there it was two and a half years you were in that role yeah what happened how did it all end how did it come to an end Aye, well it was difficult I had a, a tough six months or so especially I had, had an operation on my hip in December 2016 um, I then had my first child in the April 2017. My dad was then diagnosed with cancer in the June. He then died in December. Oh, dear me. And I was kind of, at the same time, I was doing a job which was 24 7. Couldn't escape it. I couldn't go for my shopping, Don Fellman. I couldn't go up to town for a drink. You were constantly having to be a politician. You couldn't be negative. No matter how bad the players or the manager was doing, you had to be positive constantly. And it just all came to a head. I, I remember. Um, I think it was a Wednesday, about two o'clock in the afternoon, I was in the office and I thought, I need fresh air. I went out and sat in the stand, I just broke into tears. I, just, no. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I was, just, I was broken there, I was just done. And I'd always been a chirpy, upbeat kind of guy and never really had mental health issues or depression or, <clears throat> but I just couldn't do it anymore. I just thought, Pff. my dad had just passed away, he was in the memorial garden right beside where I was sitting. Right. I, just thought, I can't do this. 
It's enough was enough. Enough. I broke down in tears and I thought, I can't even go back in the office. I can't do this. I can't. I just thought, I can't be weak. I can't show weakness here. And I'd got to the point in my life, in my work, I just, I'd lost confidence. I doubted everything I did. I just thought, I'm not good at this. You know, I'd walk into, a, a, go into situations all the time and just think I'm making mistakes here. Just lost total confidence. And I remember going home, like over months, and I'd be playing with my, my kids or bathing them and just didn't have a clue what was going on. Mm. My head was away. It was in the clouds. And I turned to my partner one night and broke down again. I just said, I need to change this. I need out here. I need to get my life back. Yep. And that was it, really. From there, and a couple months after that, it was like, just by chance, a guy, Lawrence Brody, got in touch with me. He used to work at Hearts. He was head of marketing at Hearts. Really good guy. And he's got an agency called Electrify, based out in Livingston. He just said, that's not, I know where you're coming from all this. I've been there as well. I hit rock bottom working in football. It's, it's difficult. I want to help you out. And it kind of just, that was it really. It snowballed from there and I just thought, right, as much as I've loved working in football and met some amazing people, it's just, I had to change. I had to get my life back. And was there a sense of sort of relief after that? Did you feel the weight lifted Aye, once? Which was sad in a way because it's always been my dream to work for the Pars and represent the club. You know, I was going to supporters' funerals wearing the blazer and what an honour. Mm -hmm. What an honour that was. And, Aye, I walked out, we just started the, the 2018-19 season and I walked out after the second game, that's when I left. It was a massive weight off my shoulders, couldn't believe it. you have any regrets? Uh, I, a few, I, I think, looking back, like I say, I'd never been a manager, so going into that kind of environment was tough. Mm -hmm. I maybe shouldn't have been a bit, a bit tougher, no, no soft on certain decisions I made. But no, nah, no regrets really. What an opportunity to... Yeah. Be general manager of the club you, you love. You mentioned that there was there wasn't a lot of resources there to maybe assist you. Do you think that yeah. played a big part in? Uh, definitely, aye. Definitely. Clubs at Dunfermline's kind of level, it's, it's so tough. People don't understand how, how hard you know the staff work. You know, people are working seven days a week at times. Mm. You know, you're working a match day, you're doing 13, 14, 15 hour shifts. You know, and people probably think, oh, how can you moan about that? But you know, I think in any line of work, that's a, that's a big shift, isn't it? It's tough, it? it's tough, and football's your, your obsession, your passion, but at the same time, it's your job, eh? It becomes your job. Yep. A Saturday match day for me was no longer about going to the pub with my mates and watching the team on the park. It was about making sure sponsors were okay, or we've got enough pies left in that stand. How, how are the programme sellers getting on? Are they behaving? Are the police are in my ear saying, we've just had to chuck someone out, so here's the details, can you deal with that on Monday? And half the times it was my mates, by the way. <laughs> so it was difficult. It yeah. was really difficult. But I no regrets, really. Good. Two years down the line, you still following the pars? Aye, of course. You got to. I've got two wee boys now, so I it will be uh, in the blood for them as well. But I've I've only been back twice since I, I officially left. It's it, it's kind of it's tough. You you leave a job. It's like any line of work. You you leave a job. You you don't really go back. So. It's been it's been tough. I had to cut it kind of out of my life for a wee while to get my head back eh, normal again because I was just in such a bad place for a while. But yeah, nah, I'm all good now and aye, we'll be back. Nice one. Do you think there's a chance that they'll be promoted this season, do you think? It's looking good. I think Stevie Crawford's doing a great job. I think he's signed well in the summer. I think Stephen Whitaker coming in. That's a great, an exceptional great. signing. Um, but it's looking good. Good result on Friday against your team. <laughs> uh, but no, nah, fingers crossed. You know the club needs to be back in the Premier League. That's where it belongs. You know, Dunfermline's got the potential to, you know, have six, seven, eight thousand at, at games if the club's flying high. Yep, you know, it needs to be back there. It's been too long. Nah, the fans must. I mean, that, that the revenue that that will affect that club is frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the, the the positive as well during this this tough time of COVID is the German investment as well, which is coming, mm -hmm. which was I think was needed. You know, the club needing fresh money. Yep. Supporters have dug deep for you know, what, nearly 10 years now since administration and just getting fresh investment, fresh ideas into the club, I just think that's, that's brilliant. I know we just talked obviously about how it ended and it maybe wasn't the best best mm -hmm. way to end things. You were still there for two and a half years. Yeah, You must have had, must have loved it at some point uh, as well. Uh, have you got any aspirations to return to the football industry? or Not at the moment. No. I'm quite happy at the moment. Um, just being a family man and living a quiet life. I quite like going to Aldi and not getting 
abuse <laughs> <laughs> or asking why a certain player's not playing. So what are you doing yourself now? What are you doing yourself now, Mikey? So I'm back working my, my nine to five, so to speak, is back at Fife College, back in the marketing team. I was only at Electrify for six months, unfortunately. It was a great place to work and I, I certainly didn't plan on leaving, but the opportunity to go back to Fife College, which was five minutes from my house, childcare on my doorstep, you know, just having two young kids, it was just, that was a no-brainer at that, that stage of my life. You ever thought about writing a book? Nah. I think you should. No. Nah. From the terraces to the, the nah, boardroom? I don't know. Might sell about three copies. <laughs> and that's my mum, my sister, and my missus. Well, I'd certainly buy it as well, <laughs> mate. Mikey, I do appreciate you coming on the Salt and Social this yeah, week, no ladies problem. and gentlemen. Mikey McKevich. Thank you.